Hello, and welcome back to the Ever-Changing World Podcast. I'm your host, Ava Zanetti, and I hope you've enjoyed your week. I am back for another day. The podcasts look like they will be uploaded every Tuesday. I'm going to make sure that happens. Um, Today's podcast episode is super exciting as so much news has come out in this area. Of course, I'm talking about the James Webb Space Telescope. It has recently launched and many things and many recent news has recently happened in actually the past few days. As of recording this, I believe some of the news has just came out. So this episode is going to be super exciting. Um, Of course, I love space, so this is a super interesting topic for myself. I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, so you kind of get to listen in on a a few moments of that. Um, Before I get into the bulk of this episode, I hope you enjoyed last week's podcast. I hope you guys are planning. I definitely know I am trying to get better at planning. I have a ton ton of summatives to do this week, and I am trying to plan everything out. I mean, I'm recording this on a Monday night, and I have a presentation tomorrow, so definitely working on my planning skills, and I hope you guys are too. Um, 2022 is going to be a great year, and I hope you guys use some of that advice from last week's episode. Um, in terms of today's topics, I really want to look into, um, a few key areas of the James Webb Telescope, and, you know, before I kind of discuss those areas and before I get into it, I want to give a background on myself and on my interest in space, because I think that'll give you a good idea of why I'm so interested in this telescope in the first place and maybe get you a bit excited about this as well. So I have always really loved space, you know, ever since I could pretty much walk, I have loved space. Uh, Of course, when I was younger, I had the whole, I want to be an astronaut. And I mean, even now to this day, if anybody wants to send me to space, they definitely can. Um, I I love space and I definitely would go and I'd love to be able to do that. Um, And as well, when I was younger, I had thoughts of going into physics, uh, theoretical or astrophysics, Though I don't think I like math enough to go into physics, so I don't think that's on the plate anymore in terms of career, but I've always I've always just been fascinated by space. I mean, the idea that we've gone up there is, is insane, and the idea that we've gone to the moon is insane, and I mean, the, you know, the person we're talking about today regarding the telescope uh, helped us get to the moon, so it's quite crazy how fast we've come in such a short amount of time. The space program is still quite new. And all of the things that we've discovered in these, you know, only a few hundred years of really looking at the stars in lots of different ways is insane. You know, from Galileo to now the James Webb Telescope, we have really been able to set our eyes onto the cosmos and learn so much about this thing that a lot of people really didn't even think existed. If we really think about it back, you know, even a few hundred years ago, maybe a thousand years ago, people did not believe that this was a thing you know in Galileo's time people didn't believe that uh the earth wasn't the only thing and that they didn't believe that the sun orbited uh the earth orbited the sun they believed that the sun orbited the earth so you know a few hundred years ago um you know these discoveries would would sound like witchcraft but now it's really coming to fruition and even even the science and physics we understand today could really be broken and, and, and twisted with the knowledge we gain from the James Webb Telescope. So we're definitely in such an exciting time. We have so much technology at our disposal, which I think is so amazing. It's so great to be born in this time, living in this time, and understanding everything that we do and, and getting to be at the forefront of all this new technology, going to Mars and all of that. Though I won't be discussing going to Mars today, um, I do want to focus on the James Webb Telescope. So, leading into that, I hope you get a a decent understanding of how much I love space. Uh, I mean, talking about it right now, you probably can get a good idea as well. Uh, I think everybody has some sort of fascination for space. I mean, it's going to help us become a multi-planetary species, and and it's such a wonderful thing to learn about, and it's so exciting. So, I think many people are are going to enjoy this episode, even if you aren't uh, super into the space industry. That is absolutely fine. Um, That's what I'm here to talk about today. That's what I'm helping help you understand. Um, so the, I've kind of six main topics to discuss about the James Webb Telescope today. Um, and I might be doing a little bit of research as we go, so bear along with me. But the first six that I have here is kind of who is Webb and why is he important. The second is what is Hubble, the importance and what has it done. You will understand why Hubble relates with Webb uh, shortly. 
as well as what Webb is doing, so kind of what is accomplishing and, and why we have this telescope going out into space. Um, fourth, I want to talk about kind of the differences between Hubble and Webb and what they do. Fifth, I want to talk about what has currently happened. There's been some new exciting developments in this area, so I want to talk about those and what has currently happened on this day. For reference, today is January 10th, 2022. January 10th, 2022. So if you are not uh, listening in recent time, there could be way more developments, especially if you're listening about six months from now. There's going to be more developments. So research if you are listening to it a little bit later. Um, as well, the final thing I want to talk about, of course, is the future of web and what comes next. What is going to happen uh, when it gets to the L2 point? So... To start off on today's episode, I'm going to talk about who is Webb and why is he important. Um, you know, you may be wondering, well, this is, you know, you're talking about space. Why don't you just talk about space? Who cares about why it's named after someone? But, but really, naming something after someone, no matter if it's a monument or a building or a telescope, has a significance. You know, there's always a reason why something is named after someone. Of course, it could just be because someone bought a building and they just named it after themselves. That happens a lot. But if it is named in honor of someone, it is named in honor of someone for a huge reason. Um, you know, you don't just name things after someone just because. Um, there is a reason. You know, you're not just going to name a telescope after someone just off the street, right? Webb has been such an important person in space development and in spaceflight and in the Apollo era, in the moon program. So that is kind of what I want to discuss today and really get an idea of um, to think about because uh, James Webb has been so important and we named the telescope after him for a reason. So as I mentioned, he was a part of the Apollo era. So um, a little bit of brief history on the background of spaceflight. Um, of course, we know about the Cold War and the Soviets versus America uh, over getting to the moon. Um, so kind of the Soviets began their space program. It used originally for military reasons that it was kind of for prestige points and all of that, which I can discuss at another point. But to kind of brush over that, NASA was formed in the late 1950s. I just looked it up, if you heard me typing, uh, to make sure I got the right date. It was founded on uh, uh, July 29th, 1958, and James Webb entered at NASA on in February 1961, and he was there until November 1968. So he was not an engineer. He was not a scientist. He was not really anybody that did anything with the specific aircraft. He actually was a government official. So kind of looking, and all the resources that I use in today's episode is from NASA directly. Again, I will always link those in the bio if you want to do more research, and you can kind of see if I'm picking anything out of these resources, that's what I'm talking about. So looking at kind of Webb and who he was, he was a manager and an attorney and a businessman. So um, kind of looking at this, he was a, uh, he served as a director of the Bureau of the Budget and as an undersecretary of state in the Truman administration. So he served as president and vice president of multiple uh, private firms and served on the board of directors for McConnell Aircraft Company. So he was not, again, as I mentioned, a science or engineer, um, which is something that uh, actually President Kennedy asked him to consider um, when he had the job as the NASA administrator. So uh, if you don't know, President Kennedy was a huge, huge role in uh, getting us to the moon. Um, of course, he passed away and got shot before he could ever see it come to fruition, um, though he was such an important man. Um, a great book that I highly recommend that I have read a bunch, uh, all these facts I know about it, is uh, from the book Shoot for the Moon. Um, it is all about the beginning of spaceflight to um, Apollo 11. Um, it is by James Donovan, and again, I will link that in the description. Anyhow, um, President Kennedy was a huge prominent figure during this time. Um, he was the whole person that said, let's get to the moon by the end of this decade, and the end of the decade was the end of the 60s. So that's why we got to there in, the in 1969. Um, that's why we got to the moon in 1969. So it was, it was really all off of Kennedy's behalf. He always, you know, had such a 
a, a prominent want for us to go to the moon. He realized the importance. And, you know, truly without his support, I don't know if we would have gotten there as quickly as we could. Of course, their technology was super advanced for its time. So, you know, all of this... It was absolutely insane. We did it in the time frame that we did. And in doing so, you know, Kennedy really pushed us to do that. And especially when he passed, I think that put another fire under people. Anyhow, so he was such an important person. So whenever you hear kind of Kennedy during this NASA, beginnings of NASA time, you know, you may wonder, well, why was he important? Well, he, he just did so much. He inspired so many. And, you know, you can do more research on that. And I'm sure I'll talk about that in further episodes. But he was an important, very important man. And that's why we have a whole space center named after him in Florida. Um, anyway, so a lot of people in the specific scientific community at this time was actually extremely anxious about Webb. So, you know, of course he was not a scientist and he didn't really know anything about space. So, um, they, they, they really wanted someone who knew about space, who had an interest in space, who had a background in space, because, you know, they think, of course, these, this person would understand what we're doing a lot better than someone who just kind of randomly walked in you know sure web might be experienced but you know what's the experience going to bring to the table when you know they have a love for space or they have a love for science that could be a lot more so you know the scientific community of course would be hesitant and you know it, it, it worried them though within a few months he kind of proved where he stood so again looking at nasa's website at the height of the apollo program nasa had 35 thousand employees and more and more than four hundred thousand and more sorry than four hundred thousand contractors and thousands of companies and universities one of the most notable universities i probably you probably heard of is mit they did a ton for the apollo area um and that was across uh web's direction so you know they of course had the whole job of getting a man on the moon which they did do and that was because of web so, I don't have the exact details on exactly how much um, his budgeting was good, and, and that is, again, in that book that I had read, Shoot for the Moon, though I'm going to just kind of explain what he did. So, originally, I believe it was around $13 billion they estimated that the Apollo program um, would cost at the time, and again, I'm kind of just paraphrasing, I don't have the resource right in front of me, so take this as a grain of salt, do your own research to make sure I'm saying things right, but, uh, they, uh, they originally, the scientists thought it would cost around 13 billion, and Webb actually told the government that it'd cost 20 billion dollars, and the NASA people, you know, people that worked at NASA said, you're crazy, like, why are you overballing so much, why are you adding so much money, and, you know, what's really funny is that, uh, it actually costs a bit more than what Webb had originally said, it costs a bit more than that, so, it, it, the thir if they went with the $13 billion, or and how, how much exactly it was, um, that the Apollo program would cost, they would be really screwed, because then the government would say, well, you said it would only cost $13 billion, and now you're asking for more, and you're asking for a lot more? This is ridiculous. So Webb really played a huge role in budgeting as well, which I think is, is a really important thing to note, because, you know, as much as you can think about space and all of this and all these amazing things that happen in space... You can kind of look over the fact that uh, budgeting is super important. I mean, even to this day, NASA doesn't get paid a ton. Um, I believe they get, in, in, with inflation, they get paid similarly to what they did uh, around this time. I mean, they've been paid similarly for a bit, but um, they don't get paid a lot. So having a master of budgeting is super important. As well, there was a lot of different wars and conflicts going on during this time, and a lot of people didn't want to worry about spaceflight. They thought it was ridiculous. They could have had domestic issues to fight rather than spaceflight. So Webb kind of contradicted that. He combated that, and with doing so, he, he afforded us to go to the moon. And without that, um, I, truly, we just wouldn't have been able to afford to go to the moon uh, no matter what. So that was super, super important on his part. Especially when a bunch of people who aren't scientists are listening to the budget, it, it was important because Webb was not a scientist, but he talked to other non-scientists. So he kind of, you know, he 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 stopped using all the specific science terms that uh, uh, a senator might not understand or might not know, and he skipped over that and explained in really simple terms why they needed the money, why it was important, and that helped them tremendously because you know as much as a scientist or an engineer. Are, you know, they're brilliant, of course, and they would know so much about it, um, they probably wouldn't have the budgeting skills and the skills 
as a business person and who has been through multiple practices and who has the skills of talking to an audience in a simple way and um, talking to a specific audience how they should be spoken to, right? Senators should be spoken to a different way than scientists should be spoken to when talking about these issues. So Webb was a super, super important man during this time. Um, here I have a little quote. So as NASA administrator Sean O'Keefe said when he announced a new name for the Next Generation Space Telescope, he said, It is fitting that Hubble's successor would be named in, honors of, in honor of James Webb. Thanks to his efforts, we got our first glimpses at the dramatic landscape of outer space. He took our nation on its first voyages of exploration, turning our imagination into reality. Indeed, he laid the foundations at NASA as one of the most successful periods of astronomical of discovery. As a result, we're rewriting the textbooks today with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, the Sanchroid X-ray Observatory, and the James Webb Telescope. So, you know, that quote, really, I couldn't have said it any better. James Webb was such an important man, and really, I truly as well don't think it should have been named after anybody else, as he he was so, so important, and he helped so many people get to space, and truly, uh, I don't think we'd be as far as we are without him. So, he he was an amazing man, and, you know, knowing knowing who he is, I think you can kind of put into perspective of why the telescope is named after him. And you can kind of get an idea from the quote as well is what this telescope is doing. It's looking at more space discovery um, and looking at more astronomical things that we can learn. So when we look at who the name things people are named after, it is so important. I mean, the example I gave previously as well is Kennedy. Um, President Kennedy um, was super important as well in this era. And that's why he has a whole NASA building named after him. So all these people were super important. And this time in history was probably one of the biggest. I mean, we haven't had a huge, huge uh, accomplishment in spaceflight, or really in a while, as a, as a nation, for a very long time. So the Apollo missions were definitely very vital for us. So the next thing I want to definitely talk about is what is Hubble? So you guys have probably seen all of the um, beautiful Hubble images um, online. If you look up uh, Hubble image of the day, there's so many different images that pop up. You can see the image, images that were taken on your birthday, all of that sort of stuff. It's a, a fun thing you can look up if you're really interested in it. Um, and you see these beautiful, beautiful galaxies and nebulas and all these crazy astronomical uh, occurrences in outer space taken by Hubble. And, and you, you really think, how is this thing taking these pictures? And, and now we're just sending out, you know, a camera to take pictures. And and really, it's it's not just about that. So before I get into the details of Hubble, um, again, I will talk about what it's named after. So it was named in honor of the trailblazing astronomer Edwin Hubble. So basically, it is a uh, large space-based observatory which has revolutionized astronomy since its launch and deployment by the Shuttle Discovery in 1990. So during the... a little bit ago, um, per se, the... The space shuttle program was huge. Um, there was multiple deployments of space shuttles, multiple different types of space shuttles. A few of them were usable, a few of them crashed, which, of course, you can hear the whole big Challenger explosion, one of the most tragic events um, that you can think of in space history. Um, but these these did a lot. They built the ISS as well, which I will not be mentioning in detail, but they also uh, helped deploy Hubble. So these rocket ships, is what they really are, helped do a lot for us and helped uh, let us research even more. So those have also been really important in our history. So that is what Discovery is. Um, again, I am reading this from the NASA website in case you were wondering. So basically a little quote here is, Far above rain clouds, light pollution, and astronomical... As, um, atmospheric distortions. Hubble has a clear, crystal clear view of the universe. Scientists have used Hubble to observe from the most distant stars and galaxies yet seen, as well as planets in our solar system. So basically, um, Hubble, you know, had a had a uh, had a certain time period that it'd be operable for, but it's actually grown immensely and it's ha had over thirty years of operation. So this thing has been out there for a very, very long time. Of course, it was deployed in nineteen ninety. So whenever you're listening to this, you can kind of think about how long that has been. Um, so 
this is um so mentioning why this has lasted so long and it's because uh new cutting edge scientific instruments have been added to this telescope over the course of five astronaut servicing missions so by replacing and upgrading aging parts these servicing missions have greatly extended the telescope's lifetime so without astronauts we would not have the telescope that we have today so hubble has been super 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 um important and has really been uh at the, at the um help of astronauts as well so Hubble has made more than 1.5 million observations over the course of its lifetime. So over 19,000 peer-reviewed science papers have been published on its discoveries, and every current astronomy textbook includes contributions from the observatory. That is so huge. I mean, one space telescope having been in every single textbook, and, um, you know, astronomy textbook, of course, and being such a prominent thing is, is insane. I mean, all these crazy images that you see of space um, that you might put as your wallpaper or you uh, might look at in awe, you might like the picture on NASA, is probably from Hubble. That's how much of an impact it's had. You know, we don't think about where these things come from, but Hubble has been so important. And not just for pretty pictures. Um, it has tracked down interstellar objects as they soared through our solar system, watched a comet collide with Jupiter, and discovered moons around Pluto. It has also found dusty disks and stellar nurseries throughout the Milky Way that may become fully-fledged planetary systems and studied the atmospheres of planets that orbit other stars. So Heather had pe Hubble has peered back into the universe's distant past to locations more than 13.4 billion light years from Earth, capturing galaxies merging, probing the supermassive black holes that lurk in their depths, and helping us better understand the history of the expanding universe. So that point is really important, uh, mentioning looking in the past, and that is kind of what James Webb is going to be doing, and I'll be mentioning that in a moment. But, um... Kind of explaining this concept of looking at locations 13.4 billion light years from the from the earth how would this make sense that we can see from the past well um light travels fast but not as fast as you'd think so on these very large large distances if you look at a star in the sky let's say it is it is pro it is probably billions of years old and that is because of how fast light travels from us to a respective object in the sky so if we use the sun, for example, it takes about eight minutes from the sun's light to get from the sun to Earth. So we think of, if we think about that kind of speed on, on such a large scale from these crazy objects all the way on the solar system, um, we, we can see the past, literally, which is absolutely insane to think about. I've always loved thinking that we can quite literally see the past, see the past of all of these objects, see the past of the universe um just by kind of looking through our telescope so that's why hubble has been able to look back so far we don't have a time machine but if you count a telescope looking at distant objects a time machine well there you have it that's a time machine so kind of seeing that uh it, it, it's it's super insane and also i'll be detailing kind of more on how that works in web and of course i'm paraphrasing again i'm not using quite the proper astronomical terms so i'd also make sure you're looking in textbooks and making sure that I'm fully correct, but that's kind of the layman's terms of it, that we can kind of see the past from these things, which is really crazy to think about. So in over 30 years of operation, Hubble has made uh, observations that have captured humanity's imaginations and deepened our knowledge of the cosmos and continue to do so for many years to come. So just want to make sure that I have all the details on Hubble. I mean, it is has been such an important telescope for all of us and for astronomy um and it's so interesting to think about it so i'm going to make sure i have a few more little facts here to make sure that i don't miss anything um so looking at this oh i do want to mention that we cannot um serve as Hubble anymore because of the retirement of the space shuttle so just so you know that we cannot keep servicing it um so here I also have a little fact that Hubble is not expected to re-enter Earth's atmosphere until the mid to late 2030s at the earliest so from now about in 10 years it can it'll probably hit the atmosphere and that's at the earliest so 
mentioning here, due to a force called atm atmospheric drag, which affects the orbits of satellites like Hubble in low Earth orbit, Hubble's altitude is slowly decreasing. So eventually it will re-enter, just like other things like the ISS. Those things will all eventually re-enter. Um, so I do want to make a pointer of that because I did not mention this, that Hubble is in low Earth orbit. So it's not sitting on the ground like a normal observatory. It's just a little bit above Earth where it's continue it's kind of considered that it's in space though if you really think about it, it's not that deep into space while web is going out much much farther which is why i can see much much farther which is what i will go into right now so hubble has been super important it's in low earth orbit eventually it will come down but everything that we've learned from it has been insane it's super cool to learn about and um definitely check out all those cool images that we've had we've learned a lot from it and it's definitely done us part so now we need to talk about Webb. So the James Webb Telescope is is so revolutionary. So they've been working on this thing for about three years. So I want to make sure I get this fact right, and I'm going to look this up. So, um, let me make sure I got this right. Sorry about that little awkward pause. Um, but I want to make sure I, I, I want to make sure I get all these details right so you're not misled in any way, shape, or form. Though I do believe it has been kind of built for 30 years. I know it's been built for decades and decades. And, and this, th this launch has been pushed back and back and back. Okay, here it is. So discussions of a Hubble um, follow-on started in the 1980s but serious planning began in the 1990s so basically after hubble they were thinking okay we need to do something else and that's where webb was born so this has built been built through nasa and the csa and the esa so that's the canadian space a agency as well as the european space agency and really what uh the james webb telescope is going to do it's going to help us learn even more about our early universe so as much as hubble has looked into our early universe and done what it's could um James Webb is going to do so, so, so much more. So, kind of here detailing from NASA once again, it will study every phase of cosmic history. So, from when, within our solar system to the most distant observable galaxies in the early universe. So, how are they going to do this, you may ask? Well, they're going to use a specific infrared telescope. So, it's made of, you know, kind of infrared technology that will explore a wide range of science questions to help us understand the origins of the universe and our place in it. So, looking at this, um, it, it, it's such a powerful website. I mean, not website, sorry. Such a powerful telescope. Um, you know, the scale of how powerful Hubble is is pretty crazy. But looking at Webb, it, it, it's such a powerful, powerful, powerful scope. Um, the most powerful telescope that we've ever had. And it's, and it's going to um, be super important for us. So, it's, it's such a prominent thing in the space industry as well as for astronomers. And, and Webb has been so important. If you've heard a lot about it in the news, this is why. Um, and basically, scientists will use Webb to study planets and other bodies in our solar system to determine their origin and evolution and compare them with exoplanets. So exoplanets that are um, not planets in our solar system, planets in other solar systems, and um, planets that orbit other stars, basically. So Webb will also observe um exoplanets located in their stars habitable zones so basically when a star um sorry when a planet is in a habitable zone this is called the goldilocks zone just like the fairy tale goldilocks you know not too hot not too cold this is where uh, a planet is habitable which means um a life form can live on it so it can be something as small as a little microorganism all the way to you know something like humans or crazy aliens so looking at this we can kind of see really are there other um species out there and of course we're looking basically into the past so these species could very well be dead um but knowing that there could be life outside of our solar system is super important and super exciting and something that i hope i will be able to know one day in my lifetime and hopefully web will be able to do that and we'll be able to figure something out um <laughs> though i do think there definitely is species on other planets though we won't get into that discussion um so pretty much in these habitable zones it means that they could harbor water on a surface which could mm, basically say if um habitability is present so of course as you know on earth every species needs water 
and that would be likely for other species that they would need water to survive so looking at that that is how we can kind of determine if these exoplanets would have species on it so this is using a technique called transmission spectro spectroscopy um which is which the observatory will examine starlight fil um filtered through planetary atmospheres to learn about their chemical composition so that's like a really huge mouthful that i just said there i'm sure i pronounced a lot of words wrong but um <laughs> basically it's it's just going to be able to determine um the basics of whether or not the exoplanets have life on it or not which is super super exciting stuff so let me make sure i have all the web details right um i totally recommend going to the web website it has so much so much so much information on it um as well as some super cool thing to, to see where web actually is um i am going to look right here i believe i already have this open and i'm looking something up i don't need to but that is okay um yeah so looking here it's going to observe kind of the very first stars and where they formed and galaxies over 13.5 billion years ago the really interesting thing is as i mentioned 13.4 billion years 13.5 billion years ago we're still kind of unsure how long it's been though many scientists say around 13 billion years ago the earth started from the big bang so that's kind of what we go off on um but you know you can kind of think about however you'd like like to um, so I'm going to mention a few quick facts about Webb so you can kind of get a good idea of how big this thing is. Of course, again, you might want to look up what it looks like so you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about so you don't have to exactly picture, um, what it is and think about that. So, right here, let me make sure I get this right. So, on Webb, there is a primary mirror. So, if you... If you are looking at an image, it's this kind of big gold plated mirror, though there isn't actually a lot of gold in it, which has that um, appearance. But it's this huge thing with kind of these 18 gold plated hexagonal deployable segments, um, which is kind of the mirror shape. And this size is about 21.3 feet or 6.5 meters across. Um, so if you want to think about it, they do mention a lot how um the sun shield which is underneath it is about the size of a tennis court so this mirror is huge and the um sun shield is also huge so the sun shield is underneath web and the reason why there's a sun shield is um so that the sun cannot hit um web and kind of disturb its findings so what web will be doing when it gets to its l2 point or its deployment point is it's going to be turned around from the sun so the sun can't disturb any heat on it. And it's going to have these sun shields to make sure it doesn't do that. And um, it has these five very thin, it's about the size of a human hair. And it's going to kind of hit that. So the L2 point, which I've mentioned, which I do want to mention so you make sure you understand what it is, is basically just a location in, in space that we picked. And it's 1 million miles or 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. And it is orbiting the sun so it's called the second uh Lagrange point or l2 point so these um sun shields are super important as well as the primary mirror of course and this is going to help so it doesn't overheat and the primary mirror is a big gold the big gold thing that you see in all these images and i'm also looking at an image here to make sure uh you get an idea of it and then they they kind of have these sticks um pointing out to almost this triangular shape pointing in front of it that's the secondary mirror and of course there are the sun shields so those are kind of the main important things on web um all these things help of course web do what it needs to do um and do the science that it needs to do so kind of looking at the sun shield which i want to make sure i got those details correct um yes it does keep it cool so basically um, it'll observe primarily uh, the infrared light from very faint and distant objects. So in order to be able to detect those faint heat signals, it'll need to be extremely cold. So the telescope needs to be super, 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 super cold. And that is what the sun shield is going to do and what it's going to be protecting. So I did get that correct. Thank goodness. And uh, that's basically what the sun shield will be doing. And that's why it is super important. And even though the sun shield is super thin and it looks like a bunch of tin foil slapped together... It is doing a lot.
and a lot more than you think it would for uh, the little amount that is there. So, now moving into the fourth thing I want to talk about. The difference between Hubble and Webb. So, as you heard, both Hubble and Webb are looking into the distant past of the universe. Um, looking at that, we you really think, okay, well then, isn't just Webb replacing Hubble? You know, Hubble's in the lower, or, lower Earth orbit, you might say. It's useless now. Webb's going out a million miles away, literally. And it's it's going to be able to signal so much more. And it's going to signal these faint things and explore so much more. What is this doing? So a lot of people usually um, kind of think of uh, Webb as a replacement for Hubble. Though NASA likes to think as Webb as kind of the little stronger brother to Hubble. So, it, it, they both have their importance. So, Webb is kind of the scientific successor to Hubble. So, science goals were motivated by the results from Hubble. So, so Hubble's science pushed us to look at longer wavelengths, to go beyond what Hubble has already done. So, in particular, more distance objects are more highly um, redshifted, and their light is pushed back from the UV and the optical into the near infrared. Thus, observations of these distant objects like the first galaxies formed in the universe, for example, requires an infrared telescope. So Hubble helped us helped us want to explore more, which I think is great. And Hubble has had its importance, a huge importance, and Webb is also going to have such a huge importance for us. So talking about redshift, this is a super interesting topic, and I want to make sure I describe this right as I've been kind of researching on the go a little bit here during this podcast because as much as I like to talk about my knowledge, um, I am not a scientist and I want to make sure that I am saying all the right things. So basically here, redshift is the displacement of the spectrum of an astronomical object toward the longer red wavelength. So kind of speaking in a little bit of an easier way. Um, when we see objects um, and we see they have this kind of red tinge, that's what we're talking about this red shift and then we also see blue shift which we see uh kind of more of a blue coloring to it so um when a star emits light the color of its light absorbed on earth depends on its motion relative to earth so if a star is moving towards the earth the light is shifted to higher frequencies of the color spectrum so more bluish and a higher frequency shift is called the blue shift so that's exactly what i mentioned um, in contrast, if a star is moving away from Earth, its light is shifted to lower frequencies on the color spectrum, which is more of a red shift. So, what we think, and to mention this and why things are moving away from us and why things are moving closer to us, um, we think, of course, that the universe is expanding. And if the universe is expanding, there must have been a point that it expanded from, which, of course, is the whole idea of the Big Bang. We think the Big Bang is the way that it started. It makes the most sense using our current physics knowledge right now. We don't know a lot, actually, um, about about the universe. Um, as much as we know, it, there's still so, so, so much to know. Um, we have the whole conversations about dark matter, as well as, you know, thinking about Big Bang. And yeah, okay, maybe it started from this one little point, but what, what was there before it? How did it just come from nothing? How would that make any sense either? So, you know, kind of, kind of looking into that, it's a super super interesting concept and if you really want to go into the details of uh the big bang and, and you know that's what we're going to be learning from web so you know hopefully we learn about that soon so these debates can kind of die down and we can truly truly learn about why the universe started how it started really how in more ways than why um but you know this whole red shift blue shift concept is super important because when we see a more red object we know it's farther away from us we know it's moving away from us so we know that kind of that the universe is expanding that's why we have this knowledge of um that the universe is expanding using this blue and red light so all of these crazy space topics are super interesting if you want to do more research on it again i highly 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 recommend it so um you know kind of web allows us to look at these red shifts and and, and really be able to look at this at an infrared level that Hubble could not do and at a stronger level and be able to explore all the things that Hubble has taught us in a deeper, more thoughtful level. So Hubble and Webb are also, are both super important. And um, without Hubble, we cannot have Webb. And of course, Webb is going to expand our knowledge, but Hubble has been super important. So I hope those little descriptions of those space facts also helped as well. And if you need to do more research, definitely do it. Um, 
because I definitely am probably not the person to uh, describe that in the best way possible. But I hope you got a got a got a good idea of blue shift and redshift from that little explanation. So moving into my fifth point, what has happened? This is super super exciting. I I can't believe it. The Space Webb Telescope, the James Webb Telescope, sorry, <laughs> mixing my words here, is fully deployed. What does that mean? Deployed from when? How? Okay. Let me start uh, on December 25th, 2021. Um, the James Webb Telescope launched. Um, it launched on our largest rocket that we actually have. It had to be folded. So the whole issue with Webb is that it, it, it's just too massive. It sounds funny, but the, but the Webb Telescope was just too big. It was too big to fit in, in any any rocket that we have to date. And in the rocket that we have, we had to kind of squish it in, almost. So we had to fold web. And the reason why it's so exciting that it has been fully deployed is that it's fully opened up. Which means that all of the danger points that we had, which I believe there are about 300 points that could go wrong. And if anything of those points went wrong, it could not work. That means web could not work. If, 300, if one of 300 things went wrong, it could not work. Which was super concerning and super nerve-wracking. And it still is super nerve-wracking as we aren't at the L2 point yet. Though, it's fully deployed so we can breathe a little bit. A little bit right now. But, basically on um, December 25th, it finally launched. This thing has been in the works for over 30 years. People have dedicated their whole lives and their whole careers to this telescope. And it's finally launched. I mean, you might have heard about this launching a few years ago. And it, and it was supposed to launch a few years ago. Um, but it didn't. And now it finally, finally, finally did, which is, which is great. Um, so it had, as I mentioned here in this Forbes article that I'm reading from, it had 300 single point failure items, which I didn't mention, 50 parts and 170 release mechanisms of the $10 billion telescope. And if it did not work, it, it, if one thing went wrong, it could not work, which, you know, $10 billion on the drain and... 30 years would be a lot for the space community. So um, they were able to do it. They were able to fully, fully deploy it. So what does this exactly mean? And kind of what does the deployment mean? So here again from the um, Forbes article, Webb's thrilling and flawless deployment has seen his five-layer sun shield lowered so that was those really thin little kind of tinfoil-like things I talked about a bit earlier. Unfurled and tensioned. So that means it's been fully kind of, kind of, if, if, the way to think about tensioned is that if two people were at the end of a parachute and they were both kind of pulling um, towards themselves, that's when it's tensioned. So when it's kind of propped up like that, like a trampoline or a sturdy trampoline. Um, and the sun shield has five super thin layers, dozens of pigeons, motors, gears, springs, and a whopping... 1,312 feet of cables. That is crazy. Um, and all these, there was 107 release mechanisms that need to fire um, to cue this. So deployment ha um, has also involved the primary golden uh, segmented mirror to be raised and a secondary mirror extended and the wings open. So basically the whole thing to open up. So it, it was folded like a little piece of origami into this massive rocket and now it's finally been unfolded without the paper really crumpling a lot, which is really, really nice to see. Um, so thinking about that, I also want to get a little bit more information about the full deployment. Um, I believe it just began, uh, sorry, the full deployment happened two days ago. So January 8th, it happened. Um, want to get the right date there. And it fully locked into place. Of course, everybody was super, super, super exciting. And now it's just traveling out to the L2 point. So, um, again, this has been super important and super exciting. I'm so glad I'm recording this episode today because it's been fully deployed and that's something super exciting. So, again, I do want to mention this point. Actually, this is super interesting. Um, the size also meant, so the size of the telescope, that there wasn't a vacuum chamber on Earth large enough to test the telescope in its fully unfurled configuration. Instead, engineers are carefully watching how the telescope reacts to the super cold zero G environment of space as it deploys and adjusting the deployment phase accordingly. That is insane to me. We, there's nothing big enough on the planet to test the thing, to 
put the thing in a rocket, there was nothing big enough to properly to properly manage web, which is really funny to think about, but it, it's quite amazing how far our technology has come that we can just do this and that engineers can watch this thing from a million miles away and make sure that it's working. Of course, astronauts can't go out there and fix it, but they can kind of make sure that it's it's, 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 it's doing what it needs to do in the way, you know, the best way it can. Um, so they couldn't test this thing, and that's why it's also super exciting that it fully unfurled and you know, we, we couldn't fix it while it's up there, so it is super exciting and important for everybody, and I think that is super exciting that it's been fully deployed. Um, now, I do want to talk about what comes next. So, now that we know, okay, yeah, whatever, it's been deployed, it's opened up, when are we going to get some pictures? Because Webb is also going to take some pretty pictures of pretty galaxies that Hubble has, and maybe there'll be different galaxies that we can see, different uh, solar systems, whatever it may be. Um, so, Right, kind of the idea here is that um, it's going to observe the universe again from the L2 point, a million miles away, and it'll get there, as of right now, uh, Forbes is saying, um, it will get there on January 23rd, 2022. I want to get the little Where is Web website pulled up here. Um, this is a great website to see where exactly Web is. You might be a little too late if you're listening to this episode while Web is at the L2 point. Um, but here is actually, uh, the little image that I have here. So, on this website, you can kind of see where Web is. You can see how, wh what temperature the cold side is. Right now, it's at minus 298 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is pretty insane. And the hot side is at 131, uh, degrees Fahrenheit, which is, again, pretty insane um it's way past the moon that happened a long 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 time ago the sun shield's been deployed secondary mirror primary mirror and now the mirror segments is kind of something that they're waiting for i believe based off of this yeah based off this little diagram here so it's almost at the l2 point which is super exciting time of recording this is 13 days away though you might be listening to this later so it's probably already there um so from there okay yay it's at the l2 point now what it's going to do um well, it's going to get there, and it's going to make sure that it has to align. So, basically, they need to phase the mirror and make sure that it's aligning properly and making sure the instruments are working. So, they'll start turning on the uh, instruments after a week or two um, so that they can kind of cool them down and calibrate them to get ready for their, quote-unquote, first light. So, they can't just start working this thing. Um, they have to make sure it cools down, and they calibrate it and get it ready, kind of like when you start your computer and let it slowly wake up, especially the uh, older one, you know, they have to kind of do that, which is kind of funny. Um, so, January 11th, so the mirror deployment will begin on Tuesday, January 11th, which is actually tomorrow for me, and if you're listening to this, that is to, on the day it came out, that's today, um, and it is expected to last for two weeks, so though the mirror won't be fully aligned until April 24th, 2022, um, it's going to be a very kind of painstaking task, so they talk about how long of a process this is going to be. So it's going to take about five and a half months or six months to switch on and test Webb's instruments. So it's going to take a long time before we get some beautiful images from Webb. It's going to take a little bit. The first images are not going to come out, um, from my point of view, for about five and a half months, six months. So it is a little bit of a waiting game to the first images before we get any exciting space facts. But as of right now, it is so exciting that Webb has been fully deployed we have fully opened this thing up, and it is definite that uh, Webb is going to, well, maybe not definite, again, knock on wood over here, but it is um, definite that it has been deployed, because <laughs> it, it just happened a few days ago, and it, it's really promising that Webb is going to work, and we're going to discover a lot. I mean, through this, we could discover so much about our universe, you know, there's so much physics that we could discover even, and this could quite literally rewrite textbooks. If we learn some sort of new physics concept from this telescope, we could rewrite our own literal textbooks, which is insane that we're at a time where technology has advanced as much, where, you know, this is almost expected. It's almost expected that we could rewrite textbooks and rewrite concepts and all of these things. I find it super exciting. I hope listening to the podcast, you guys have found this super exciting. Um, kind of as a wrap up, I, I, I really think that the web telescope is super important as well as Hubble, as I also mentioned, 
Both both of these telescopes have been super important for space, for space flight, and revolutionary for us, and revolutionary on the things that we understand and about the universe and how much we understand about it. We can learn so so much from Webb, um, even though even if physics isn't completely changed from this, because uh, it definitely could not be completely changed from this as well. Um, Webb is going to be so important, and if the most you get out of this is some pretty space pictures, I think it's. It's done a pretty, pretty good job. Um, <laughs> I also think that um, it's, it's a super exciting time for uh, the space industry. Um, looking into kind of the billionaire space race, quote unquote, and all the things happening in web um, is so exciting. And I hope if you're interested in space, you consider going into the space industry, research it at least. I know I'm still researching careers, so you definitely don't need to pick your path right away, but... If you're passionate about something, definitely go towards it. And it's such an exciting and cool development in space history. Even if you're not super, super interested in space, I think knowing about Webb, knowing a little bit about what it does, learning about who Webb is, learning about the Hubble Space Telescope has been good for you. And I think it's definitely so interesting. Um, Again, I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening to this podcast. It's my second podcast recording, so thank you for, again, bearing with me while I get kind of the podcast um, figured out. I'm glad I figured out finally a schedule date, so I will be posting every Tuesday as of right now. That's what I think will be the best for me. Um, and I right now, all the podcasts are available either on the Acast website um, or it's also available on Apple Podcasts where you can listen. I mean, if you're listening right now, you figure out how to get there, so that's great. Um, you can also connect with me on Twitter and Instagram. So my Instagram handle for this podcast is ever.changingworld. Again, ever.changingworld. Go follow there for updates on when episodes will be coming out. The second one is Twitter, everchangingwor, everchanging, double O-R. Um, you can, um... You can see that again in the comments. W O R again, if I did not say that correctly. Um, and if, again, you can listen to this podcast on the website. Thank you guys all so much for listening about this. Um, I hope you have a great week. I hope you have a great day. And I hope you are just as excited about space as I am. Again, thank you for tuning in and listening and follow on all the socials. Thank you.